Welcome to the Recruiting Stories Podcast, where we celebrate recruiting by exploring the stories of leaders and top performers by digging into their stories and understanding how recruiting has impacted their journey and their success. All right, welcome to another edition of the Recruiting Stories Podcast, um, powered by Cover 3 Consulting. I'm your host, Adrian Chapman, and today our guest is William Vanderbloom. William, welcome. Thanks, Adrian. Great to be with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you on. Um, you know, we've had a lot of people, we're focused in the transportation logistics industry, um, you know, is who we serve and, and typically who we speak to. Um, but we get a chance to speak with different people around the country. And um, William is an author. Um, he's written a book called Be the Unicorn. Uh, it's uh, 12 data-driven habits that separate the best leaders from the rest. And he also um, owns a, a search group. William, will you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, some of your background and how you got sure. to work? Sure. Yeah, uh, it's a, that that's a long, windy road. I'll try and abbreviate it a little bit. But, uh, you know, grew up a pretty hopelessly chronic entrepreneur, uh, mm -hmm. even as a young kid. And golly, I think back to some of the crazy things I tried. It was not not smart. But uh, then went on uh, to college to do an MBA. I was going to do it in three years and then take over, you know, maybe the Western Hemisphere or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, along the way, ran into kind of the party scene in school. Uh, the wheels got wobbly. They came off the track. It was uh, it was a mess. Um, but, you know, kind of at the at the lowest moment there um, had a, a spiritual awakening. So I was mm -hmm. I was raised going to church, but basically because that's what you're supposed to do is go to church. Um, that day is gone now. People go because they <laughs> want to. Um, but that sort of awakening really kind of lit me up and mm -hmm. gave me a sense of purpose, not just let's go take over the world, but like, wow, I could do something that lasts beyond this world. So I um, went to Princeton for seminary, went into a uh, local church ministry in the Presbyterian church. By the time I was 31, I'd been asked to come lead First Presbyterian Church here in Houston, which is the oldest church in Houston. It's where Sam Houston went. Um, probably 5,000 adults and a couple thousand kids in a school and you know, you, you learn when you live in Texas, you learn to be careful with the word big, but it was a, it was a pretty good sized church. And uh, then left that went through a divorce and was a single dad with four kids. Um, I wouldn't recommend that, by the way, listeners. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it's unavoidable and it was, but it's still not my recommendation unless you have to go there. But anyway, single dad, four kids you know, not in any shape to be leading people spiritually. So I went into the oil and gas world. And while I was there at a very large company, the CEO said, you know, I've been here nine and a half years, which is a long, long time for a Fortune 200 company. I've been here nine and a half years. It's time to find my replacement. And so they hired this thing called a search firm, an executive search firm, part of the recruiting world. And I'd never heard of such thing. And I, uh, so I was doing, they had me on like a management rotation sort of thing, do a year in this department, a year in that department, and kind of learn the business. And my first year there was in the HR department. So I kind of got a front row seat on this whole succession and finding new person and using the search firm. Uh, I would say I was on the team for that, but that's, that's a reach. I was like maybe the third string water boy for the team, but I got to see what was going on. And uh, wow. My goodness, they got done in 90 days. They had a new CEO. It was all done, neat and tidy. And I had just never seen anything like that. I went to Wake Forest undergrad and then Princeton for seminary and then straight into the church world. And the church is incredibly inefficient at finding pastors. I mean, like no company in America would survive. Uh, so First Press Houston, which is a great church, had taken three years to find me. I was there six years, and then it took three years to find the next guy. So they had a 12-year span, and it's a good church. And half the time they were with the pastor and half the time they were looking. And it's like, what? I mean, wow. Yeah. So I'm watching this, you know, recruiting story as the podcast, you know, right? I'm watching this search firm. It was Corn Ferry, which is the biggest and one of the best in the world. And... uh I'm like, I wonder if there's a way 
to to take this business solution and plug it into my old world mm-hmm. and try and help those organizations find their leader faster. Yeah. Uh, I remember Adrian and I, I, I by the way, love your name. <laughs> uh, I, I'm married to the uh, feminine version of that name. Sure, yeah. I, I got a great picture. I was in Philly. Oh, gosh, it's been a few years ago on a search and found the Rocky statue. They moved it. It was up on the steps, but I found this down below. And I, it was right when Instagram was getting popular. And I took a picture of me by the statue. You know, I just finishing a run saying, yo, Adrian, I did it. So yeah. I love the name. But yeah. uh, <laughs> we had just gotten married and I came home and I said, and we had six kids and a new house that we could barely afford. And I said, babe, I think I'm supposed to quit my job and start something new for churches. And she just looked at me and said, that's because churches love new ideas, right? (laughs) Right, yes. Probably the same in the transportation world. I mean, you know, you get into something that's been around a long, long time and change is not the most friendly thing. So it was a stupid idea. It was really dumb. And, and, And Adrian, it was the fall of 2008. Uh, so if you're yeah. listening and you weren't in the business world yet, then just Google 2008 economy. <laughs> it was like arguably the dumbest time in my lifetime to quit my job and start something new for churches. Yeah. But um, off we went. And and now, you know, 15 years later, we've completed over 3000 executive searches. We've worked with hundreds of thousands of candidates. We've branched out past churches to pretty much anything faith based schools nonprofits, even kind of the Chick-fil-A's of the world. And it's it's been a fun ride, but but it never would have been here had I not been the third string water boy on this team uh, that watched a, a professional search firm do their work uh, and, and get things done faster and better. So uh, I love what I get to do. I, I um, you know, I don't love cold calling. I don't, do, you know, but I do love uh, people. They're just endlessly fascinating every one of us is so different and to to get to be in a crossroads of their life where they're thinking of making a change and be with an organization that really needs a senior leader and we're usually looking for the whatever the c-suite equivalent of of the client is um man that's just it's humbling and i love it so more than you wanted to hear but you know you ask a a recovering preacher an open-ended question and yeah of course well uh as as it may be I'm I'm a pastor's kid, so uh, I'm I'm fascinated by the work you do. Um, seeing, um, yeah, as a kid, my dad go through those processes. Uh, as you know, I was growing up, having been on pastoral search committees myself. It's an interesting thing, and I've seen probably, you know, I, I jokingly say, I've seen the good and the bad, you know, yeah. uh, that that comes with. Uh, I think both church leadership and the search process that happens there. So I can 100% see the need uh, for um, someone to help shepherd that process. And uh, I think it's pretty cool, uh, the work you do. And I know it's it's well needed at the same time. For you, think going back to that, um, you know, was there any one individual that perhaps was, um, I don't know, a, a catalyst for you? Obviously, you were part of that group and so you got to you got to be a fly on the wall so to speak and watch that search firm work um was there anyone that that kind of inspired you to 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 be Uh, you know go on this this is like i've got my 30 seconds and i just won a golden globe and i got to rattle off all the names i I, I don't even know where to start there's so many uh there was one guy that actually the search consultant from corn ferry um once things were said and done he tried to hire me Mm -hmm. um and I thought it was like good looks and competency, but it really wasn't. It was all the connections I had. <laughs> so, nothing to do with me. Um, and he wanted me to try uh, healthcare search. They didn't have any healthcare, and we have a, the largest medical center in the world here in Houston. Yeah. And he was really great. He he asked me this awesome question. Now this was uh, 2008. Okay, so the iPhone was about to come out. So you got to like drop back in your mind technologically to what that was like, right? Uh, it wasn't as bad as when you'd have to pull off and find a payphone <laughs> when you're out on the road, but but similar, right? So he says to me, I was like, Bruce, I don't know if I'll be any good at this. 
And he said, hey, listen, imagine this with me. Okay. You've had a good year. You're able to take one of your daughters on a one-on-one ski trip. She's a teenager. This is your chance to bond, lifelong memory. You're on the ski lift and your phone rings. What do you do? I said, well, it depends on who it is. He said, you're going to be fine. <laughs> I said, why? He said, first of all, you had your phone with you. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, you had it on and you looked at it when it rang, even while you're on vacation. And thirdly, you use discernment to say, well, it depends on who it is. You're going to be fine. So he really helped me kind of believe that things were possible. And then when I started the firm, I uh, a year prior to starting the firm, joined a small healthcare search firm that worked just with faith based hospitals. So really tiny little niche. Mm-hmm. And, and the guy who started, it's like, I can't pay you anything. We can share some fees. Uh, I can't give you any equity. I'm just getting going. He had been with Russell Reynolds, which is an amazing search firm. And I said, fine. And he said, I'll, I'll let you build the church thing if you want. And so I started and uh, he was so good to me. Mm-hmm. He he taught me the right way to do things. You know, one of the problems, if you're using a recruiter or if you are a recruiter, here's one of the the blessings and curses of the industry. The blessing is You want to be a search guy or a recruiter, you just hang a shingle and say, that's what I do. It's awesome. You can start right away. The backside is you don't really know who you can trust because you got a lot of people just trying to make a buck. Mm -hmm. You got a thousand different business models. It's a highly unregulated industry. And, you know, Ed, the guy who took me in and taught me search, he really did it the right way. Mm -hmm. And he's a decent guy. And, And I think you can do good while doing good business. And yeah. he showed me the way to do that in exec search. So that's, again, longer answer than you wanted, but those two guys probably come to mind. That's good. No, I, I, I echo the sentiment that, um, you know, recruiting is, um, you know, it is it is unregulated. There's so many, it's so easy, quote unquote, to get into the business. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, I also think it's easy to separate yourself if you're a person with character and standards and ethics. That's right. Things, right. That's right. If what you say you're going to do, um, then guess what? It's really easy. And I've said this, this is the way that we've built cover three is um, we, we've really just said, hey, we're going to do one search at a time. We're going to work mm-hmm. you know, one client at a time, and that's going to be our focus. And, you know, uh, we've been able to because of that, um, you know, we've done a good job for somebody and they've told somebody else and then they've told somebody else. And uh, that's yeah, great. of course, we do, you know, you know some outbound um, connections and things like that, but we haven't had to do a ton of that just because as long as we've done a good job for one group, um, it's continued to roll out for us. So, uh, well, I'm still learning every time and, and I'd be, you go kind of negligent not to mention one other guy. So I mentioned the consulting firm, Russell Reynolds, which arguably started the search industry back in the, you know, like post-World War II time. Mm-hmm. And I thought most of these like, uh, Corn Ferry is Lester Corn, and I think Roger Ferry. I don't remember Ferry. Maybe it's Bill Ferry. I don't remember. Anyway, I thought, well, it's Mr. Russell and Mr. Reynolds. And then I get a call, oh, probably 12 years ago from Russell Reynolds. Oh, wow. Yeah, he's like 654 years old or something. And uh, he's like asking me to help find a pastor for his church. Which I thought was pretty funny. I'm like, dude, don't you own a pretty big search? And he said, no, 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 no. The thing is, your niche is very different than anything else. I want somebody who knows the niche. Yeah. And it's probably the same in the transportation industry. I Maybe I could learn how to do what you do, but I don't know the pain points. I mean, I can say, oh, my father-in-law was interstate right. commerce commissioner, ran railroad stuff. But that doesn't, that doesn't tell me anything real about why... You, why do people in transportation get divorced over work issues? Why, why, you know, what are the real, and, and Russ came to me and said, I'll even teach you what I know about search, use it in your niche. And we've become pretty good friends. So, uh, yeah. Uh, it, it makes me think of an example that I use oftentimes is I, I we're fishing guides, right? Like you could, you could go out and try to catch a fish, but if you talk with someone who fishes those waters every That's single right. day, well, in the world that you're in, uh, you know those waters better than anybody else because you're fishing them. Every that's time. exactly right. Um, and I and I'm the same for for transportation, and and that's why you hire a search. And it's and it's your fish to catch. Exactly right. I can't make you do it. I can put you in the best position, but I can't make you do it. 
You, your oh. line has to be in the water. You you got to reel. You got to do all the work. Absolutely. That's yep. we use the same image with uh, climbing a mountain, and you take one of those little Nepalese guides. You know, that's me. I'm the short little dude that lives on the mountain. I've been up and down it a million times. I can tell you where the potholes are. Please don't step yeah. there. But you're going to have to climb the mountain. That's good. That's good. Well, so let's talk about because you've you've climbed a bunch of these mountains, right? So in that process, in that time, uh, you've gathered a ton of data, and that's what uh, led to you writing this book, Be the Unicorn. So I'm, I'm curious, um, maybe a little bit, what what point did you say, one, I needed to write a book, and that two, um, you know, these, these leadership habits, right, not traits, but habits um, came about for you? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, first of all, just a word to everybody listening. You don't need to write a book. <laughs> don't do it. If you think you need to write one, go try everything else first because mm -hmm. you're you're not going to make any money. OK, and it's going to be a giant pain. Yeah. Uh, I, <laughs> we have seven kids now. Uh, so I've been in the labor delivery suite a lot and I've never given birth to a kid. So if you're listening, I'm not comparing pain or anything like that. Like, I don't know what that's like, but I watch what my wife's gone through. And, you know, it's nice on the other side, but it's not much fun. That's kind of like writing a book. <laughs> you got a message in you. You got to get it out. It's going to be really painful and then yeah. it'll be out. Um, so I just, you know, certainly didn't write the book to get a book. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually, let's see, my fifth book. And um, the last time I wrote one, I said, I'm not doing that again until I've got something really good to say. And then the pandemic hit. And I, golly, I can't imagine what dealing with clients and transportation was like when everything got shut down. But like in our world, every one of our clients was closed indefinitely. Yeah. I didn't go to business school. That's seminary degree on the wall, but uh, no business school. And I did learn a business lesson. If all of your clients close indefinitely, your calendar frees up a good bit. <laughs> so, you know, so does your cash flow, but that's a different podcast. Yeah. Uh, and and during that shutdown, we did a lot of things to help our clients. Like, how do you do things online? How do you do, you know, all kind of resourcing, even down to how do you get PPP money from the government to cover your payroll? But we still had time left over. And I wanted to answer a question. Here's the question. And you've had this happen, Adrian. You, you meet a candidate. And it's rare. But every now and then you meet a candidate and you go, within five minutes, you go, oh, this one's special. Now, I'm learning as I get older not to immediately assume that means they're a fit for the job I'm interviewing for. But there's just it's a, it's a magic. It's a something in that first five minutes. And I've always wondered, like. I'm not real gullible. Mm -hmm. I'm usually pretty skeptical. So what. What magic is happening in that five minutes that's making me go, this one's different. I've always wondered that. So we get to the lockdown and we're looking back at searches and when we do a search. You know, we interview maybe a thousand candidates. We interview, you know, whether that's just a quick email exchange or Zoom or whatever. But when you get down to the end of the search and you've got your very best candidates, like your top 10, every one of those candidates gets an in-person face-to-face interview from us. And it's long yeah. and tedious. It's not a cookie cutter, but it's got a basic pattern. So during the pandemic, we realized, you know what? We've done 30,000 of those now, yeah. uh, which is a lot. Yeah. And even better, I have this sort of maniacal team around me who's actually kept up with all the interview notes and where those candidates ended up and how they're doing their jobs and did they get promoted. and all. So we were able to go and identify the 30,000 were our best interviews ever. And we were even able within that to say, who are the best within that? Like, who's the top 1%? Yeah. Okay. And it's still locked down out there. So we've still got time. And we said, uh, do these people have anything in common? Mm. And we studied, we figured out, and what we figured out was, yes, they do. And it was nothing like what I thought, and it might help anyone who needs to stand out of the crowd. So why do I say this? I thought it would be, oh, they're all um, really smart. Yeah. No, no. Uh, they all have a great pedigree from a school, and they you know, were able to network to get their job. No, 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 no. Um, uh, maybe they're all, maybe he was the quarterback. She was the head cheerleader. Maybe it's that simple, like popularity. Nope. What we found was there were 12 
very clear habits hmm. that these unicorns, as we call them, almost instinctively perform. Hmm. And they're habits that the rest of us almost instinctively neglect. Yeah. But the like the punchline to the whole study was, but if you wanted to practice them, there's no reason you can't learn these 12 habits and become one of those people that within five minutes, the recruiter says, oh my gosh, this one's special. So it's like we unearthed this magic treadmill mm -hmm. that can get you better looking and shredded and chiseled than anything else out there. And it's proven by data to be true. Yeah. And you've still got to get on it and run it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not a not a uh, easy bake oven sort of thing. But you, the data shows that these 12 habits, if you will apply these in your life, if you will master them, you will stand out in whatever crowd you're in. And that could be dating. It could be applying to college. It could be your first job. It could be just trying to get along with people. It could be building your team out and teaching them these habits so that your company stands out and has magic within five minutes with a customer. So way more than you want to hear, but we basically unearthed the magic map for people that stand out in the crowd. Well, I, I, I love, I love that it's habits, right. Rather than just traits or attributes, right. Cause the world, right. that I think of personality, traits or personality assessments right and so those are a big thing and so in many ways I, I can't tell you how many organizations that i've come across and they're like we want this specific personality yep. right and and not that i'm completely against that entire idea but um reading reading that book it so many of these stuck out to me for a number of re reasons whether it was something i personally related to or from like you said there's when I thought through the high level leaders that I spoke to, I'm like, 100 percent, they, they've got these. Um, well, and, it, and the interesting thing, Adrian, is if you read the table of contents, and you say these 12 habits, you're going to read the table of contents and you're going to say, duh, William. Yeah. Of course, these things matter. The difference is this is not William's random ramblings or opinion. These are data proven right. habits so like we called it uh be the unicorn right if i had a secondary title it might have been huh i guess mom was right because <laughs> a lot of these habits are things that parents tell their kids be on time like <laughs> you know <laughs> prepare for the meeting uh, right. you know be genuine it's right it, but to have the data behind it and we spent probably a third of the book doing interviews with these unicorns about how they practice these things and what makes it. So you, you're not hearing from me, you're hearing straight from them about how they find their way to these habits. And I think it's going to help a lot of teams and a lot of people who need to stand out in what is now a very tight labor market. And it's not go pick whatever job you want. Absolutely. Well, I want to talk about just a few of them here real fast. Um, well, while we're talking about them, right? Cause there's, there's 12 different habits few of them stuck out to me that I'm, I'm curious about because some of them are, like you said, some of them are very obvious, others maybe less so. Um, one that stuck out to me that I, I feel like is uh, maybe less so is is um, is agile, right? Because um, there's things like fast or authentic, but agile. Tell me a little bit about wh what that means for someone who's in uh, leadership and why that's so yeah. important. Yeah, well, a lot of these habits get better with age okay like self-awareness is one uh you ever hear those saying somebody said to me i'll get it wrong but it's something like why is wisdom wasted on the old and youth wasted on the young <laughs> you know there's when i went to this church when i was 31 years old i had no freaking clue how far in over my head i was i just i did i was 31 so i knew everything so that's yeah, awesome right. but uh, uh you know so with age self-awareness should improve some Mm -hmm. Agility is different. Agility naturally atrophies. It naturally goes away. And I didn't even think about this until my, my three-year-old taught me this. You know, I'm sitting at home. Uh, I try and go run a little bit to stay in shape, but I'm not a, a super flexible guy. And I got to an age where I needed to stretch to keep from, you know, getting injured and be able to keep running. 
I'm sitting there stretching, sweating more during the stretch than the run. Couldn't touch my toes, just dying. And the three-year-old walks in and looks at me and doesn't say a word. She sees me struggling and she sits down on the floor and ties herself in like a human pretzel and looks up at me, you know, kind of smirky and stands back up and laughs out loud and leaves the room. That was the entire interchange. And I just thought, okay, I'm the old man. But then, then I thought, I had a thought, oh my gosh, William, every day you're alive, you get less flexible. Who can stretch like a three-year-old, two-year-old, one-year-old? <laughs> every day we are alive, we become more set in our ways. We become more uh, calcified. We become stiffer. And the unicorns fight like mad against that. They just can't stand it. They keep trying new things. They keep learning on the job. They keep taking up a habit that they never had before. And, and that level of agility, I mean, golly, for those of you who, who were employed all the way through the pandemic, you probably kept your employment and maybe even got promoted because you kept learning things you hadn't seen before. I mean, was that not the test of agility? Was, well, how are we going to do that now? And figuring it out. and and. You know, even before the pandemic, the rate of change in this world was growing so fast. And, you know, pandemics in the rear view, it's over. But man, with this era that's coming with AI, which is going to replace a whole lot of jobs, probably create a whole lot of new jobs too. But if you're stuck in your ways, you're going to be left behind. Yeah. And it was so refreshing to me to see that the unicorns fight that calcification because I'm not naturally flexible. My wife can bend over 500 different ways without a stretch. If you're going to stand out in the crowd, you have to develop the ability to increase your agility and not just fight the calcification. And it, and I mean, that's, that's just, even, it, think about transportation. I remember one year I was looking at a nonprofit that needed a CEO and it was like, Lots of moving parts, really fast relief organization in disaster situations, right? So, you know, hurricane happens, this group comes in, tries to make everything better. Then they move on to wherever the earthquake was. And I interviewed a train master mm -hmm. and I've never interviewed one of those, but those guys are cool. I mean, they, they can multitask like an air traffic controller. It's pretty awesome. And, and I kept his name. He didn't work out for that job, but there was another one that required that level of agility and multitasking. He's done so well in his career. So mm -hmm. it's that kind of, of how do I learn to be agile and change with the times? And, and in an industry like transportation, probably not a lot's changed with the times. So uh, if you can do just a little bit, you'll stand out of the crowd. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, a change. Of the, uh, it's just maybe failure is a constant in, in transportation, right? Because there's always issues, um, but not a lot has changed, right? I mean, there's... Uh, you move things by truck, train, boat, airplane. That's, right. that, that, that's it. Um, but if you can say, hey, let's figure out new ways, new technologies, et cetera, um, that might be um, a great way to stand out and, and be different. Or, so, or new ways, new ways of solving problems for customers in a way that makes them feel better than if the problem had never happened. Yeah, that's good. You, you guys in transportation, in the church world, um, we say, you know, the sound guys have the worst job in the world because the only day they get noticed is something when something screws up. <laughs> and that's probably pretty true in the transportation world. So how could you create a, a customer like a, another habit in the book is um, they're solution oriented. They're solvers like, OK, how do we fix this and make you happy? It's it. it yeah, there's a lot of low hanging fruit for people to stand out, especially in businesses that have not had to change much. Mm, that's good. That's good. Talk about self-awareness. That was another one that stood out to me because we all think that we're self-aware, right? We all think that we're, we all think that we, oh, of course, I, I, I feel like I saw a study somewhere that maybe this is wrong, but it felt like everyone would say that they're self-aware and the truth yeah. maybe we're not. So tell me yeah. a little bit more about that. Yeah, like, well, I think you just hit it right on the head. Uh, most of us, think we're pretty self-aware. The only people that don't think they're self-aware are the ones who actually are self-aware. <laughs> what do I mean? So the unicorns, uh, we were able to identify, you know, they 
they very clearly know who they are Mm -hmm. and what they're good at and what they're not good at. And they sign up for jobs that they're good at and stay away from ones that aren't. Um, And that self-awareness only comes through experience and pain. It's kind of like when you're dating in high school, you just date around, date around, date around. What Don't want to be stuck at the last dance without somebody, right? But you learn over time, like that one's, I'm not going to be good for them and they're not going to be good. So self-awareness is actually the rarest of the 12 habits. Mm. Now, here's just to back up what you already said, quicker and better. We interviewed all the unicorns. And it was a long survey. And one of the things we asked them was, force rank these 12 habits. What are you best at? What are you worst at? Far and away, the last place winner was self-awareness. All these superstars said, man, I got to work on that. So then we interviewed a quarter million people, just general you and me guys, right? Mm -hmm. 91% of all those people said they were above average in self-awareness. So this is, it's exactly what you're describing. And I, you know, I think if there's one habit of the 12 to work on, this one's it, get honest. And it's not fun. You know, I, I remember my physical right after I turned 50, it was very revealing. It was not fun. Right. So uh, or or maybe, do you remember the first time you heard your voice on a recording and you're like, that's not me. You know, it's like that, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, the unicorns are just pretty bent on figuring out who they are. And, and that could be as severe as I had some real trauma in my life and I need to work through the issues that came out of that. Go for it. Go see somebody qualified to help you with it. That's awesome. It could be as simple as I'm going to take five personality inventories and read everything I can to understand how I'm wired. Right. And I'm going to make sure one of them has a 360 component where some of my friends are taking the thing about me so that I, you know, we even built that tool for uh, the yeah. unicorn, see how you're doing. And you can see how your friends think you're doing around these 12 habits. It's uh, uh, because, because frankly, we were kind of stunned that self-awareness was yeah. something that only the best think they're bad at. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Well, you know, it it makes all the sense in the world to me, whether it's, you know, um, I don't know. I I was always an athlete, right, my my whole life. Um, And so I was always shocked at, you know, the level of so many people, maybe they thought that they could compete at whatever thing it was, right? Whether we're in track and field or we're playing football or we're in the gym, I do CrossFit now. And so, you know, you talk to an average guy, let's just say, and they think that they can bench press 300 pounds or, or whatever it is. And and the thing to me is I'm like, whatever your goal is, whether you want to bench 300 pounds or you want to lose some weight, like you got to go look in the mirror. Right. And you got to take a real long, hard look and and be That's honest right. where, where you're at, because uh, the, the reality is you're probably not quite where you think you are. And that's OK. But um, you got to start somewhere to get to where you want to be. And, and you got to recognize where you're at. So that's great. Yep. hundred um, percent. Likeability, um, being likable. Um, this is one that uh, I loved seeing in there because I have long been a big advocate in just the world that I live in um, recruiting because um, it's just a must. Likeable people. Uh, they're more fun to work with. They get further in interviews. They lead better. Um I could go on and on and on. So seeing that really stood out to me. Why did that make the list? Well, it made the list because that's what the data showed. That's the easiest, you know, it's, um, but what's interesting is there's such a vicious cycle with trying to be likable Mm -hmm. because usually what happens, and, and we see this in teenagers, if you've got a teenager, you've seen them do something totally stupid and self demeaning to try and get people to like them. And it just backfires or they do something to try and grab the spotlight. So people will see how great they are and, and it doesn't make them likable at all. So, so the secret, if I give one life hack around likability, the most successful people I've ever been around are the hardest people on the, in the world to get to talk about themselves. They're just almost always focused on the person they're talking to. They're making direct eye contact. They're doing uh, inquiry to say, what are you doing? How can I help you? It's it's never about the individual talking. 
Yeah. And the the irony is the more these unicorns pour into others and listen to other stories, the more people want to know about them and the more likable they are. So it's, just, it's a pretty simple hack. In a yeah. conversation, how much are you talking about what you're doing and how much are you asking others about what they're doing and what's exciting in their life? Mm, that's good. Make it less about you and more about them. Yeah. It'll make them think more about you. Yeah, that's good. The last one I want to just cover is, is purpose-driven, right? Um, as a Christian myself, uh, that's always been a strong and important part of my life, um, how I how I lead and how I work. Um, and so um, when you think about the data here, what does the data say about being purpose-driven? Is it any one type of purpose for these people or is it multiple right. purposes? Right. That's such a good question. And, and here's where, you know, our sample... Uh, it's skewed higher than the general population because we're dealing with faith-based people. So you I mean like, but what we found is the best of the best are laser focused on their purpose. And here's, this is, kind of, I probably shouldn't even say this because it's not a great thing. It doesn't matter what purpose it is. Like I'm going to, this is going to make people mad. Okay. The people who've gotten the most done, good things and evil things, were all insanely driven by a purpose. Yeah. I mean, you think about like arguably the the figure of evil in the world is Hitler. He was driven by a purpose, yeah. you know, or you think about you meet that top sales guy and all he's concerned about is getting his numbers up. He's getting it done. Now he's got a purpose. Now, here's what what I would add to that purpose drives results. But the more noble the purpose, the better the results will be. Yeah. Right. So so it's like find that North Star. And I'm not here to try and like proselytize people or what have you, but but find that North Star. Make it the highest hanging North Star there is. Not just I want to make money. I want a beach house. No, I don't want a beach house. Well, you don't want a beach house. What you want is a deeply fulfilling life of memories with your family. Yeah. Right. The beach house is how you get there. Like raise your eyes a little bit. And most of us don't. Right. Most of us look down and, and not to go like all former pastor on you, but I used to think Jesus was so nice to refer to me as a sheep. I, you know, cause it's fluffy and it's nice and it's docile and who doesn't like sheep, right? no. No, he, he was, he was talking to shepherds and they all knew these sheep are a big hot mess. Yeah. All they're interested in is the grass right in front of them and a sheep of the opposite gender. That's pretty much all they want. And and that's why the shepherds have to go rescue them out of cliffs and crags because they're just looking down. And if you would just look up, it'd right. change the world. As St. Augustine said, what separates humans from the rest of the animal kingdom is our ability to look up. Mm. And the problem is most humans are looking inward rather than looking up. So find the highest North Star you can, the most noble cause you can be a part of. Shoot for that and the results will take care of itself. Mm, that's excellent. Very good. Very good. Well, good. Uh, William, this has been an awesome conversation. I've, I've enjoyed it a ton. Uh, I know it'll be helpful for a lot of people. I ask a couple cu questions typically when I wrap up here. Like one, um, you know, are there any, obviously, um, uh, this book has been probably impactful in your life. Are there any other books that have been impactful on your journey that you would recommend? Yeah, the Bible. Sorry. Yeah, great. Read it Read it every year. Learn something every time. My kids are like, you're doing that again this year? Yeah. You ever learn anything? Well, that's the trick, right? Uh, and then outside that, like if I could make a companion book to be like people who bought this also like the, it, like the magic would be if you bought be the unicorn and then bought James clear's atomic habits, because yeah. he gives you a roadmap for how to apply new habits to your life. Yeah. Here are the habits that'll change your life. That's great. Get on, get on the treadmill. And uh, yeah, I think, I think uh, reading his book was very eye opening to me. Absolutely. Very good. Very good. Uh, and any advice that you'd give your 20 year old self, if you looked back at your career now? So much, you know, shut up. <laughs> That'd be one. Um, it, don't, don't rush to get to the next day. Yeah. I think in my twenties, I was like, if we can just grow the thing to this number, then if I can just get to the summer vacation, then if I can just, 
And, you know, the longer you live, the more you realize that life is really, really short yeah. and incredibly fragile. Mm -hmm. And everything here is just so temporary. So I'm trying to learn to just sort of say, you know what, this is the day I got. I got a mentor, John Maxwell, he actually wrote the forward to the book. And he said to me one time, I think he wrote a book about it. He said, you know, William, today's what matters. Uh, yesterday is a canceled check. Mm. Tomorrow is just a promissory note. Today is all that matters. And I, I wish I'd have known that younger. That's good. I can relate to that a lot myself, especially with uh, with young kids at home and running a business. Uh, I think it's easy uh, to say, like, got to do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. That's right. And and not look up, right? Like we just talked about. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I uh, appreciate all your time. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, um, yeah. let's say we need a we need a search done, um, or uh, you know we need uh, we need we need help, or obviously they want to pick up your book. How they how would they best get in the, contact? Yeah, the easiest thing to do is just type Vanderblumen into Google, and it does not matter how you sp spell it. It's honestly why we named the company after me. It has nothing to do with my need to be known. I'd rather it not be me, but. The name is so messed up that the search engine guys are like, you got to use this. So just type. <laughs> and if you go to that site, forget. I mean, if you need help finding a leader, great. I appreciate that. Um, but one thing we've done over 15 years is tried to build free resources of things we never learned in school about running a team. And so if you go on the website, you'll find roughly 4,000 completely free resources for you to use. How do I fire my best friend? How mm -hmm. do we get, you know, just things we've learned along the way. And if that's helpful to you guys, there's a podcast there. There's, I mean, everything you can imagine. Uh, the book is also there. Uh, if you want kind of the one-stop shop for the book, go to theunicornbook.com. That's all. And uh, you'll, you'll see how do I find that software assessment to see how I'm doing and how do I get some bonus content and, and so forth. Awesome. Very good. Guys, this has been uh, this has been a great conversation with with William Vanderblumen. Uh, thank you again for being on the way. Thanks for listening to the Recruiting Stories podcast. If you haven't yet, subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Check us out on LinkedIn. Adrian Chapman and Cover Three Consulting is our company page. Also, check out our website www.cov3consulting.com. Again, thanks for joining us, and we just simply want to remind you that you can change the world by putting people in a position where they can do the most good, and you do that by recruiting. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.